all four Gospels feature an appearance of the Blessed Virgin Mary somewhere in the Gospel, but they do it by varying degrees. For example, the earliest of the written Gospels is the Gospel of Mark, and Mary appears only twice, and once she is actually named. Where she is named is when Jesus appears in Nazareth, and they ask, isn't this Mary's son? The second time is when Jesus is preaching in someone's house, and he's told, your mother and your brothers are waiting for you, asking for you outside. In Matthew, Mary is featured in the infancy narratives, the story of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. However, in Matthew, Joseph is front and center in the story, while Mary is in the background. She's not a prominent character in the Gospel of Matthew. In Luke, however, in his infancy narratives, Mary is front and center. She is the main character of the Annunciation, the Visitation, the Magnificat, the birth of Jesus, even the presentation in the temple. But in the Gospel of John, which is believed to be the last of the four Gospels to be written, Mary appears only twice, and both times she is anonymous. She appears in the wedding at Cana, and then again at the crucifixion of Jesus at the foot of the cross. And each time it is not Mary was at the wedding or Mary was at the foot of the cross, but rather the mother of Jesus was at the wedding. The mother of Jesus is at the foot of the cross. Considering that this is the last of the four Gospels, the other Gospels had been written, and we know what Mary's name is, there had to have been a reason why John the Evangelist chose to include Mary in those two scenes, but never identify her. Well, the wedding at Cana is perhaps one of the most widely known stories in the Gospels and is popularly referred to as the first miracle of Jesus. But it is only found in the Gospel of John. And while it is popular for us to say that Mary was present at the wedding at Cana, that Jesus performed his first miracle at the request of Mary, his mother, it's important to note that John the Evangelist does not say that Mary is present, but rather he leaves her unidentified. The mother of Jesus was there. The mother of Jesus said, there is no wine. The mother of Jesus told the servants, do whatever he tells you. And perhaps the reason why John leaves Mary anonymous, but only as the mother, is perhaps because there is something bigger going on in this presentation of the wedding at Cana. In order to understand that, one has to understand the metaphor of the wedding itself as a time of salvation for God's holy people. In other places, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom who is among you because a wedding feast is taking place. In some of his parables, such as the wise and foolish bridesmaids, they're waiting for the wedding to take place when the bridegroom will arrive. Here we have a literal wedding taking place as part of the story. And it is in this context that the activity between the mother and Jesus and the miracle of changing water to wine takes place. It's also important to see when the wedding at Cana takes place. And it comes at the beginning of the Gospel of John after a period of seven days, a proverbial week of activity. On the first day, John the Baptist makes his appearance in the desert. On the second day, John identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. On the third day, or as it says, the next day, John the Baptist directs Andrew to follow Jesus, and Andrew in turn brings Peter. The following day, Jesus calls Philip, who in turn brings Nathanael. And then the wedding at Cana begins by saying, after the third day, which is three more days, bringing it a total of seven days, there was a wedding at Cana. And we see a lot of hints and similarities to the story of creation. So there's something bigger going on with the wedding at Cana itself as symbolic of the messianic activity of the life and death and salvation of Christ. But at her first request, Jesus does not perform the miracle, but rather he says to his mother, woman, what concern is this of yours? My hour has not yet come. That too is an important thing to note because all throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus makes reference to his hour. The hour is coming when the Son of Man will be lifted up from the earth. The hour is coming and is indeed already here. And his reference to his hour is a reference to his eventual crucifixion, that moment of glory when the messianic graces pour forth upon the world and Jesus ultimately fulfills the will of his Father. What does Jesus do in the miracle? 
He doesn't just change water into wine, but it is the best of wines. The best of wines is reminiscent of the words of Isaiah in the Old Testament. It's a prophecy that he utters, a very popular reading in funerals, when Isaiah says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples, a feast of pure foods and choice wines, juicy rich foods and pure choice wines. On this mountain the Lord will destroy the veil that veils all all peoples, the web that is woven over all the nations. He will destroy death forever. So the reference to the pure choice wines flowing down from the mountain is symbolic of the eventual messianic age in which those graces of the Messiah and the Messiah's salvation will bless the world. And now we have the purest of choice wines at the wedding at Cana after a period of seven days. So we look at the Blessed Mother the mother of Jesus, in the midst of all this. And what does she say? She says, they have no wine. And Jesus responds with a reference to his hour. We're not to presume, therefore, that Jesus performed his first miracle because his mother asked him to, because throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus is stalwart in always fulfilling the will of his father, and nothing will deviate him from that. We're therefore to assume that he performed the first miracle not because his mother asked him to, but because the hour has come. What's the other thing the mother says to the servants? Do whatever he tells you to do. This is not necessarily the mother showing her son up and putting him in an awkward position so that he does something about the fact that they have no wine. But basically her message is the message of anyone who follows the covenant of God or is a follower of Jesus. We are all called to do whatever he tells us to do. So what do we have in the wedding at Cana? We have a literal wedding in which Jesus performs his first miracle. But we also have a metaphor for much of salvation history in which the mother, unidentified, is set up as a figure of Israel making petition for that messianic grace when the choicest of wines will flow down from the mountain and the web of death is destroyed. And we have Jesus when his hour has come, providing those pure choice wines that Isaiah prophesied about when he speaks of the grace of the Messianic era. And so in understanding the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as John presents her as the mother in his gospel, we see Mary as much, much more than simply Mary from Nazareth, but the mother of Jesus, which is the people of Israel that gave birth to the Messiah, making petition, which God answers, for those messianic graces that will later be provided when Jesus gives us that salvation by his death on the cross. If you were to look in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in their stories of the crucifixion, you might be surprised to read that Jesus is alone as he hung upon the cross. Aside from the two thieves who are with him, there is no one at the foot of the cross. His closest associates are standing at a distance, and believe it or not, Mary is never mentioned. And yet when we look at illustrations of the crucifixion, many times we see the image of Mary, and sometimes the Apostle John at the foot of the cross. That is found only in the Gospel of John. But when you read that passage as you do the wedding at Cana, you realize that the mother of Jesus and the beloved disciple are not Mary and John. They are, in fact, never identified. And that is because, again, John is presenting something much more dynamic than simply the crucifixion of Jesus. Here, again, we need to look at the context of the crucifixion. John presents the crucifixion of Jesus not as a suffering servant, but as a coronation ceremony of the King of Glory. Indeed, that entire portion of John's Gospel is referred to as the Book of Glory. Jesus is not the silent suffering servant at his trial. He engages Pontius Pilate in conversation and, in fact, answers his question. He's clothed in purple and crowned with thorns, has no help in carrying the cross. We do not read of Simon of Cyrene in the Gospel of John, but he resolutely carries his own cross. In other words, what John presents is not a tragedy of the crucifixion, but a triumph of the king of glory in a coronation ceremony in which the king is interrogated with questions, 
robed and crowned, presented to the crowd, and enthroned on his cross, where he conducts unfinished business as he holds court. One of the things Jesus says is, I thirst. But the Gospels say, to fulfill scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. A deliberate action to fulfill scriptures. And then when all is finished, Jesus said, it is finished or it is accomplished. And he dies. He's very much in control and conducting unfinished business from his throne of glory that is the cross. Well, what is the other thing he does and is in fact the first thing? He sees his mother with the disciple whom he loves and says, Woman, behold your son, and to the beloved disciple, behold your mother. What unfinished business is being conducted here? Again, seeing the mother as far more than a girl in Nazareth named Mary, as in the wedding at Cana, where she represents Israel petitioning God for those messianic graces. At the foot of the cross, the mother represents the church. And Jesus places the church, symbolized in his mother, into the care of his disciples, symbolized in the beloved disciple. And that is where we continue to see the church today. As Jesus departed, he gave us the church and put it in the hands of his disciples, a church who we appropriately refer to as mother and is symbolized in the example of discipleship of Jesus' mother, Mary. And so we have something much bigger going on here, the church being put into the hands of the disciples that to this day care for that church, but also where we saw in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is completely alone as he died on the cross. In John's gospel, we see in Mary and John, or as he puts it, the mother and the beloved disciple. Jesus is not alone, but in fact, the entire church is standing in attendance at the foot of the cross as the king of glory holds court and conducts unfinished business. And this is the gospel reading we hear every year on Good Friday. And so here again we see in the Blessed Virgin Mary, as she's presented in the scriptures, going from such a simple girl in Nazareth to the model of discipleship and caring for those in need and the visitation, to giving glory to God and being set up as a symbol of Israel giving birth to the Messiah as Mary gave birth to the Savior, to one who represents Israel making petition for the messianic graces fulfilled in Christ's miracle at the wedding at Cana, to representing the church itself as it is being handed over to the care of the disciples, and the church itself standing in attendance at the throne of glory. This is the biblical Mary that is presented through the evangelists, especially Luke and John, and this is the mother of God who we honor as our model of faith, our prototype of Christian discipleship, and a symbol of Holy Mother Church.